We're going to be looking in 1 Kings this morning. If you'll flip over to 1 Kings chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 3 through 14. If you don't have a Bible and you're here in the sanctuary, you can grab one of ours. You're welcome to it. You can take it home with you and keep it for yourself. If you listen online, you're welcome to come by the, uh, our community library, it's, uh, or community garden. We have a little library at South 19th and Emerald Street. You can grab a Bible out of there. Or if you listen to us further away from Abilene, you can always email us at office at aldersgateabilene.org, and we'll be more than happy to mail you one. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by Father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked this for, for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but the discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will also give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, Father, as we are in the middle of this worship service, we pray that your Holy Spirit will rest upon each and every one of us. And may we hear your word read to us, Lord God, and as your word has been read, may it be embedded into our hearts. And now as I proclaim your, your word, Father God, help me to do so in a way that is honorable and holy and just in your sight. And may each and every one of us leave this place today a much wiser person for having heard your word read to us and walk according to your scriptures. We lift all of this up to you in the mighty name of the risen Jesus Christ. Amen. So whenever I was in college, one of my majors was history. I now specifically focused my studies on English history. Even more specifically, I studied the history of Tudor England. Now, now Tudor England was the span of years that followed the War of the Roses when Henry VII gained the throne and promptly married a woman who was born of his enemy. Now, the most famous Tudor was, of course, Henry VIII. Most of uh, English history is consumed with people fighting for that throne. Families were vying for power and authority, and they wanted the money that came along with it. Now, historically, being the monarch on this island nation, it was something to desire. desire. It was something that you wanted, and once you had it, you wanted to protect it in your family. It was something that brought with it great honor and privilege. Now, a few years ago, Netflix came out with a new series, and that series is called The Crown. Now, this series is much more about the modern-day view of the English monarchy than the historical view. It begins just a couple of years before Queen Elizabeth II was crowned queen. Now, a couple of things struck me as I've been watching this series. First of all, the transition of power from one monarch to the next is much, much smoother than it used to be. We just saw that recently when Queen Elizabeth passed away and her son, Prince Charles, took the throne. There was no war involved. They just had a ceremony and it was over with. So instead of having all the civil war and the strife and the, and the threat of death, the next king or queen just comes in and slips into the position without any problems. Now, the other thing that I've noticed from watching this series is, according to the show, no one wants to be the king. Nobody wants to be the monarch. They don't want the responsibility or the headache or all of that, that stress. 
Life, it seems, is so, so much easier if you're a member of the royal family, if you're not in line for the throne. Now, as fascinating as the English monarchy is to me, it pales in comparison to what takes place here in Scripture, according to the transition of power from, from one king to the next, as we see in ancient Israel. Now, we know from last week that God placed Saul on the throne first. But because of his pride and because of his disobedience, he was quickly replaced by the second king of Israel, King David. And so as King David grew older, the transition of kings again became this issue. Now, there was a considerable mess that took place. But finally, at the end of all of that mess, the crown was finally ended up on the head of David's son, Solomon. And so shortly after King Solomon took the throne, something absolutely fascinating happens. We see that in this morning's reading. God draws near to Solomon, and then God makes him an offer that is absolutely incredible. It's, it's unheard of. God tells Solomon, ask whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. Now, as people of faith, we generally do not teach that God is like a genie in a bottle going around granting people wishes for whatever they want. That's just not the way God works. But for whatever reason, it's pretty much what God tells Solomon whenever he approaches him. I will give you anything you ask for, Solomon. There are no boundaries. There are no rules. Anything that you want is yours. Now, I figure most of us have probably had this fantasy, fantasy at some point in our lives, haven't we? If I could have one wish that was guaranteed to come true, what would I wish for? Is it millions of dollars? I think that's probably what most of us think of first. We want more money. Then we wouldn't have to work. We wouldn't have to worry about retirement. We could buy the dream home we've always wanted to have. We could travel wherever we wanted to in the world and not have any more problems. And I'm positive because I know Aldersgate so well. Any of you that become instant millionaires, you're going to tithe to the church, aren't you? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I'm sure a lot of us would do other things with our money too, wouldn't we? I'm sure that a lot of you have charities that you like to support, that you think do good work, and you would probably give to that. Maybe some of us would establish endowments, maybe to help other people go to school or to have opportunities to do things they've never had an opportunity to do. But deep down, deep down in the very pit of who we are, we know that it is very likely we would spend a sizable portion of that money on ourselves. Well, here's Solomon with that opportunity, and he doesn't ask for wealth. Instead, we're told he asks for something far more precious than that. He asks for wisdom. But he doesn't just ask for wisdom. Solomon is actually doing something even more astounding to that. He, he actually humbly makes a confession before God grants him this request. Listen to what he says again. He says, I am young and inexperienced. I know next to nothing but I'm here. I'm here as your servant in the middle of these people that you have chosen for me, a, a large group of people you have chosen for me to lead. So give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish between good and evil because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. I love what Solomon asked here because Solomon he, he goes against conventional wisdom you, usually everyone seems to have all of the answers even when they don't have all of the the information they need to make a decision M most people refuse to admit when they are faced with this insurmountable task that they don't know what to do and so instead of just doing what they can to do to get the information, they fake it until they make it. But that's not what Solomon does. He's never been the king of this many people. He doesn't know what's going on. And so up front, Solomon admits, I don't know how to do this thing, God. I don't know what I'm doing. This job is too big for me. This job is so important. I know I cannot do it by myself. I can't succeed unless you help me out, unless you give me something that I need, this thing called wisdom. Now, I don't know about the rest of y'all, 
But I have been in over my head so many times I can't even begin to tell you. I'm sure a lot of you probably remember a few years ago spring break. It was the spring break of 2020. I'll never, ever, ever forget that week because I was at home in Muleshoe with my parents. We were seeing my parents. And all of a sudden, this, this person named President Donald Trump, he got on the television with a press conference. And he told us about something I had never heard of in my entire life, a new viral threat called COVID-19. Up until that day, I had just been living my life normally. I'm sure all of you were too. Some of us were on vacation like I was. Some of us may have had family in town, but none of us, I'm fairly sure, had a worldwide pandemic on our radar. And so just a couple of days before that, or after that press conference, not knowing what to do, I called Joe Alexander. Now, Joe is two important things in my life. First of all, he is a medical doctor, so he knows about pandemics and stuff like that. But secondly, he is our church council chairperson. And so I talked to Joe and I, I said, I don't know what to do here. You've got to help me out. So we had a lengthy conversation and we came to an agreement that, that we needed to do the hard thing, which was canceling church on Sunday, March 15th. And I can tell you, church, that was a hard, hard decision. Never had I been faced with anything like that, but we did it. And so from that day forward, it, it seemed as though we were all living in some sort of a surreal dream at that point because schools began to close and businesses were scrambling to keep food and other items on the shelves. M medical facilities were greatly cha uh, challenged. They were not able to do what they'd always been doing. They had to change their operating procedure procedures. And, and so without a shadow of a doubt, I was far beyond my skill set. I had never even thought of doing online worship, so I had no idea where to begin with it. I knew nothing about what needed to be done in order to keep a community of people who met regularly that were now out there doing their own thing somewhere else. I knew nothing about how to keep you together as one community of faith. I had no clue how to lead myself, much less this community, into this thing that was unknown. You talk about needing God's wisdom. I was sorely in need of God's wisdom. But here's the beauty of this thing. I didn't have to do it by myself. Now, I'm no King Solomon. I can promise you that. But I was wise enough to seek out help. And so I did the very best job I could to, to surround myself with people that had knowledge and who were wiser than I was so that they could help us all move forward as one church. I did not invest in this online infrastructure that we have now. We invested in it. And I didn't find ways for us to stay connected during this time of social distancing. We did that, church. And I did not reopen Aldersgate. We did all of this. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the most important person in that we, it wasn't me and it was nobody sitting in this room. It was the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. We didn't do all this stuff on our own. Our Father who loves us so much, he poured out his spirit into the leadership of this congregation. And he did so so that we could make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so it was God's wisdom that carried us through all of that unknown, all of that time that nobody knew what to do. And it was God's glory that shone through our working together. Now the thing is that, that when we look at Solomon's chapter of the story, we begin to realize something else. Not only did Solomon desire wisdom for himself, he also desired to share that wisdom with other people. He wanted all of the people in the nation of Israel to have what God had granted to him. And so he sat down and, and he wrote out hundreds and hundreds of wisdom sayings so that other people could have access to this same discernment that he had. And so today we call this collection of wisdom sayings the book of Proverbs. These concise statements of instruction are practical ways that you and I, we can benefit from what Solomon asked for so many thousands of years ago. So let's listen to a few of these. Destructive people produce conflict. Gossips alienate 
close friends. Those who close their ears to the cries of the poor will themselves call out but receive no answer. Here's one that Miranda quotes to me periodically. How long, lazy person, will you lie down? (laughs) When will you rise from your sleep? But I can quote scripture too. Better to live in a wilderness than in a house with a contentious and angry woman. (laughs) (laughs) Solomon was a brilliant man, amen? (laughs) So Solomon, he took this wisdom he had received from God and he used it for many, many years. And God, he was so impressed with the desire of Solomon's heart, he granted that Solomon would have wealth and fame. And if he lived according to God's ways, he would have a long life. And so here, Solomon, he he just seemed like this ideal king. It was as though God's nation was flourishing and we were witnessing all of these other nations were looking at what was going on. They wanted to know who this God was. And the truth is they did this for a long time. But then Solomon, he became the frog king. How many of y'all have ever heard the best way to boil a frog? Raise your hand. Oh, good. Some of you know this. You see, if you want to boil a frog, you can only do it one way. Because if you take a frog, a living frog, and you throw it into a pan of boiling water, he's going to jump out immediately. But if you place a frog in a pan of water and then slowly begin to rise the temperature, the frog will sit still and he'll eventually be cooked without even knowing that the water is getting hotter and hotter around him. Now, I've never tried that. My grandma would have killed me if I ever tried to boil a frog. But that's pretty much what happened to Solomon. For whatever reason, even this wise Solomon, he he began to walk along a slippery slope. He went out and he built expensive palaces and he filled them with all kinds of things. And he was never content with what he had. He, He wasn't content with that stuff and he was not content with one wife. He wasn't even content with two wives. Instead, we are told that he needed 700 wives. And then he added another 300 concubines to that. Now, now we do see men in the Old Testament marry more than one wife. It was very common back then. But what they were not supposed to do, they were never supposed to take wives from other nations. And Solomon ignored that command. And he filled his house to the brim with women who worshipped false gods. And as he did so, the water temperature slowly began to rise around him. Now maybe Solomon thought that he was too wise to let a bunch of these wives turn him against God. But Solomon, he was the frog king. He simply could not resist the temptation. The water continued to rise and it got too hot. And we are told that as Solomon grew old... His wives turned his heart after other gods. He wasn't committed to the Lord his God with all of his heart as his father David had been. Now I've never known anyone who intentionally jumped into a pot of boiling water. I've never known anyone who woke up one day and said, you know what, today's a good day for me to go out and commit adultery. And I've never known someone who said that they decided just one afternoon that being an alcoholic would be a whole lot of fun. I've never known anyone who just out of nowhere decided that, you know, embezzling money from the local school district is a great way to make a living. But I do know some other things, church. I know people whose marriages have collapsed because of an affair. I've known people who got caught stealing money from the local school system often claiming they were going to pay that money back later. And I've known my share of people who have addictions, addictions that have ruined their lives and the lives of their loved ones. And my hunch is that if we were to ask these people, and they were going to be completely honest with us, they would all say the same thing. At the very beginning, the water really didn't seem all that hot at first. Many times we we look around us in the lower story 
And we look around at our friends and our neighbors, and we think it's not fair. They get to have all of the fun. They get to enjoy life in a way that we don't get to enjoy life. Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we have decided to bound ourselves to him. We have bound ourselves to his way of living life. And so what we have to remember is that God didn't make these rules to keep us from having a lot of fun. He made these rules to protect us. God's upper story, it's not changing and it never will. It cannot be influenced by our temptations or because we want things to be different than they are. God will always give us the free will, though, and he will allow us to choose something other than his way of living life. But he also will allow us to face the consequences of our actions when we do that thing. So this morning, our lesson, it it reminds us that we're all still faced with temptations. We are, church. They're not going away. I promise you that. And at times, we may end up treading along the top of a slippery slope. We can't just start off strong, though, church. We have to also finish strong. That's the way it is. But here's something else to remember. If any of us have already slipped down the hill because we've fallen into temptation... It's not too late to come back. You and I can never, ever be too far from God. And we can always receive his grace to return to him and to return to the church. Our consequences will not go away. But I'm here to tell you this morning, church, returning to God's fold is the wisest thing any of us can ever do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may the grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.